Good evening and a very warm welcome to St Mary's at the beginning of our Heritage Weekend. It's lovely to see so many people here and to be able to celebrate Heritage Weekend uh, properly, as it were. We did our best last year, did a fantastic job last year, but it's really good to just be able to kick things off like this tonight and to be able to come together. So um, you're very welcome. James Lomax is going to give us a talk in a short while. It's particularly good to welcome uh, him. Just one or two practical things. Uh, if you need to leave, you go through the door that you came in from. <laughs> but hopefully you, you, you won't. You'll be, you'll be here uh, for, the, for the time before us. Uh, church will be open until 8 o'clock, so if you want to st still linger and look at some of the embroidery and other displays that are up, please do so. But of course you can return tomorrow uh, between 10 and 4 when uh, a fuller display will be out uh, and, and or on Sunday from 2 till 4. So do come back then. If you don't feel you have to squeeze everything in uh, tonight, you can come back tomorrow or on uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, you've enjoyed tea and coffee before and biscuits, I noticed. Um, if you would like uh, to continue conversations afterwards, after the 8 o'clock we, we close in here, the centre is open and the bar is open. And, well, yes, I was just looking around, you look like a thirsty lot. So um, do, do head into the bar, do continue the conversation. It's, good to, uh, it's just good to be together, isn't it? Uh, I think that's all I want to say before pretty much handing over to James. James Lomax, it's lovely to have him here with us. He was the curator of Temple Newsom House for, I think, almost 30 years or 30 years, and then has been involved in all sorts of other ways since. If you actually look James up on the internet, we all do it, don't we? Whenever we hear a name, we look someone up. He's done all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of different things, broadly, as he said to me at the beginning, around decorative arts, but also, inevitably, when he's been bound to Temple Newsom House, not, not in a bad way, um, he's found out some stories about the characters, the people involved, and one of whom, of course, uh, has a particular significance, uh, latterly for, for St Mary's, Emily Maynell Ingram, who became our patron here at St Mary's, and he, of course, wrote, uh, wrote a book about her recently. It's a shame he hasn't brought copies to be on set. He has copies on set. He might even sign them for you if you're lucky. Um, so we, we do welcome James. It's the first, first of these lectures we've done. We hope that they might become an annual thing just to celebrate our history, our heritage. So I'll hand over to James. Will you welcome him with me as he speaks to us on the country house and the parish church? Well, thank you very much indeed for those very kind words of welcome. Um, and it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to be here uh, to actually be able to monopolize a pulpit for a whole hour. <laughs> so, um, this evening I'm going to talk about the country house and the parish church. And as St. Mary's and the Holy Angels at Hallcross as two particular sort of complementary sort of case studies, if you like. <clears throat> But while I was preparing for this talk, I was reminded of one of the most poignant endings of a novel in the whole corpus of English literature. It comes on page 888 of the Penguin edition of George Eliot's Middlemarch. Quote, for the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts, and that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Well, this evening, I want to visit some of those who lived faithfully hidden lives and sometimes not so hidden and rest in the tombs hereabouts, particularly in the vault under the chapel to my left. My purpose is to look briefly at how the life of the parish church here at Whitkirk intersected with that of the big house at Temple Newsom, one mile away to the south. Let's see if we can get this to work. Whoops, gone too far. There we are. The two live within sight of each other, but represent different worlds. The house, big, grand, and commanding respect, perhaps, rather than love, a mere 500 years old, representing the human city, the earthly life, a place of hierarchy and employment. The church, modest, planted firmly in the middle of its community and venerable, maybe as much as a 1,000 years older than the house, 
representing the heavenly city, the spiritual life. They tread their separate paths, yet complement each other almost as man and wife. Thus, for 300 years, when they were not worshipping in their own private chapel in the house, the Ingrams and their successors would sit in solitary splendour in the family pew, i.e. the South Chapel, almost cut off from their community, even entering it by their own private external door. Due deference would be shown to them, tolling of the bells on the Lord's 21st birthday, on his return from the grand tour, or with a new bride. And in return, he would be expected to show noblesse oblige in his gifts to the poor, towards the education of the village children, and the upkeep of the church. But there is so much that we cannot know. Just when was a place of worship, a Whitkirk, a stone church established hereabouts? Did something else exist in Romano-British times? Was there a Celtic Christian timber church in the kingdom of Elmet? Or was one built here after, here after our incorporation into Northumbria by Edwin in AD 617? What, if any, was its relationship with the local thanes during the Anglo-Saxon period? None of this do we know. Nor indeed about the, post, about the immediate post-conquest overlords, Ilbert de Lacey and all his successors. All one can say is that the church evolved to serve the hamlets of Colton, Halton and Newsom. With the establishment of formal parishes in the early Middle Ages, the rites of presentation, the advowson, became the property of the lord of the manor, no doubt for the simple reason that he had built the church. When we reach the Templar period, from 1154 to its dissolution in 1308, we can only surmise again that it was they, as a religious order, whose purpose was to build churches for the benefit of pilgrims to Jerusalem, must have claimed the tithes, rites of presentation and supervision of the pre-existing church. St Mary's precise relationship with the Knights Preceptory, over a mile and a half to the south on the River Eyre, is not entirely clear, but it was never in any sense a monastic church. The very first named parish priest was one Paulinus, referred to in 1185, but whether he was an ordained knight or a stipendiary priest is not known, nor his successor, one Elias. The first record of the institution of a vicar comes in 1288, with the presentation of, Rob, of Roger de Thorparch by the master of the Knights Templars. There would have been no necessity for the Knights themselves to interact with the local parish, as they had their own well-appointed chapel within its precincts. An inventory of 1311 records its contents as part of their complex of buildings. It was equipped with every necessity for the full observance of their liturgy, for the mass and for the monastic offices. But when the Templar lands were seized by the crown, the great majority of them were given to the Knights Hospitallers of St. John, who continued their good work. The manor of Temple Newsom and a number of other properties in Yorkshire were excluded. But the rights of the church here, including the Advards, continued with the Hospitallers until their suppression in England at the Reformation, whereupon it was given by Henry VIII to his new foundation, Trinity College, Cambridge and it remained with them, as we know, until it was bought by Mrs. Menel Ingram in 1898. The temporal overlordship of Temple Newsom, however, passed first to Robert de Holland, and then to Mary, Countess of Pembroke, who you see dimly here, and finally to Sir John Darcy and his heirs. As far as we know, none of them had any substantial building on the estate, and they were probably largely absentee landlords. However, these were not the only noble families who resided within the boundaries of the parish. The Stapletons and their heirs, the Scargills of Thorpe Stapleton, were also significant landowners and landlords, with a substantial household some two miles upstream on the river at Thorpe. It was William Scargill, as we know, who established the Chantry Chapel at the eastern end of the South Isle at Whitkirk in 1448, with two chaplains to say masses and prayers for the dead of his family. It was here that nearly a hundred years after its foundation, the fine monument of, Sir Robert, of Sir, Ro Sir, Sir Robert Scargill and his wife, Lady Jane, was erected, one of the great treasures of the church. But it would be fascinating to know how the two chantry priests worked together with the parish priest. Very often they also s earned a small extra stipend as schoolmasters to the local schoolchildren, teaching them their prayers and catechism. The chantries, as we know, were some of the last victims of Henry VIII's purging of the church in England, surviving until 1545, 
when their endowments were seized to fund his own putative military exploits. The value of the Scargill chantry, chantry was assessed at £10, 13 shillings and threepence a year, its goods at £5, 2 shillings, and the plate at 8 shillings, and its lands at 30 shillings. The rights over the chapel eventually accrued to Sir Arthur Ingram when, the, when he acquired the Scargill property at Thorpe, included in his purchase of Temple Newsom in 1622. From then onwards, it became known as the Ingram Chapel, or later the Irwin Chapel, after Sir Arthur's eldest grandson's ennoblement as the first Viscount Irwin in 1660. But the first member of the family to be buried in the new vault underneath was his great-grandson, Edward, second Viscount Irwin, in 1688. More of him in a moment. We are on firmer ground when we find Thomas Lord Darcy's new house being built on virgin land on a direct north-south axis with the church. The date of its construction can now be given as precisely between 1511 and 1513. And from the evidence of a newly discovered inventory of 1520, it can be seen to have been up and running by that date. It was a four-sided courtyard house entered by a gatehouse with at least 44 named rooms, including a great hall, a great chamber, a great parlour, an armoury, and of course a chapel. From its place in the inventory, the chapel appears to have been on the northwest corner of the gatehouse wing, rising through two stories. Probably, if I can get this right, no, I can't. Um, uh, it's probably sort of here. Peter Breers has sort of done a suggested sort of elevation of what the house might have looked like at this time. Um, uh, the household would have entered from the ground floor on the inside and outsiders from an external door. The inventory seems to have been compiled while Darcy and his enormous household, comprising over a hundred men and many more if he was on campaign, were absent. Um, were absent at one of his other properties, maybe his even bigger mansion at Templehurst or in London. Thus, great quantities of portable materials are not mentioned, including his best objects for the chapel. But if we include his objects for the chapel at, Templehur at the Templehurst inventory of the same date, which may well have accompanied him when he was in residence at Temple Newsom, we can get an idea of the splendour of his liturgical arrangements. The mass books for the use of Sarum and York the linen altercloths, vestments and hangings of silk, velvet and sarsenet for all the liturgical seasons, embroidered in opus anglicanum and cloth of gold, and similar book cushions, <clears throat> the silver and silver gilt plate, including chalices and patterns, pairs of candlesticks, asperges buckets and aspergillia, cruets, sacring bells, thuribles, paxes, and all the rest. There were pictures, we know, of Christ on the Mount, the Crucifixion, the Virgin Mary, and elsewhere in the house, pictures of St. John the Baptist, the Annunciation, St. George, St. Eustace, St. Catherine, St. Nicholas, and St. Helena. He appears to have had four chaplains, perhaps doing, doing duty in rotation. We get a picture, therefore, of a great political and territorial magnate, who in addition would have been fully aware of his Christian responsibilities to his dependents, as well as the prestige which, would, which would, that would endow him with. At Wickkirk, we know he established a so-called hospital or almshouse, a grammar school and possibly a bead house. They were endowed with lands producing 46 pounds, 13 and 4 pence a year, and consisted of a master or warden, 12 poor people and one hermit, with a chapel dedicated to the Holy Trinity and with a grammar school and hermitage attached. The master, one Mr. Errington, had a salary of 16 pounds a year, each of the poor people were to receive one penny a day, plus a new overcoat each Christmas. The resident hermit, barber and washerwoman, were to receive 20 shillings a year. Neither the hospital nor the school or their endowments, alas, survived Lord Darcy's attainder in 1536, and they were recorded as ruinous by 1620. One wonders if it looked anything like the Aberford almshouses erected by the pious Gascoigne sisters in the 19th century. Despite all his piety, Darcy was evidently not popular with his neighbours. In 1509, having been given a grant to impark the royal hunting ground at Rothwell, he disturbed the ancient common land by used, by, uh, used by the locals for grazing. Matters were not entirely resolved by a court action, and, a violent, and violent riots ensued, involving 250 men trying to assert their ancient rights. 
But as we know, Lord Darcy was decapitated for his part in the Pilgrimage of Grace. He was buried, minus his head, which was put on a pike on London Bridge, at St. Botolph's Allgate, where his monument represents him as a cadaver, and which you can still see there today. One wishes there was a record of all that happened in the parish during those momentous years of the Reformation, of Henry VIII and Edward VI, the Marian Catholic revival, and the early years of the Elizabethan settlement. The big house and the estate, as we know, were given to Henry VIII's favorite niece, Margaret, Countess of Lennox, a devout Catholic who did little to, dis to hide her disdain for the Reformation. It was here, of course, that Lord Darnley was born, and Temple Newsom became a political center for Catholic intrigue. How she cowed Lady Lennox Cope during these years can never be known. Presumably, she retained Lord Darcy's chapel and maintained her own chaplain, saying mass in private, well away from the official gaze. Being royal, perhaps she could get away with it. But how did this impact, how did all this impact on the life of the parish? Wouldn't one love to know how divorced or not was the religion of the big house from that of the parish or the average parishioner at this time? We simply do not know. It is only with the appearance of Sir Arthur Ingram as the new owner of Temple Newsome in 1622 <clears throat> and his subsequent rebuilding of the house that a new relationship between the mansion and the church could have emerged. Yet here again, we find little evidence of the interplay between the two. Despite the enormous cost of the new mansion, Sir Arthur was almost continually absent, either at Ingram's palace in York as Secretary of the Council of the North, or at Sheriff Hutton, or in London. Sir Arthur's religion, like his royalist colleagues, was evidently for the newly defined High Anglicanism of King Charles and Archbishop Lord. As an example of this, we know that he presented two huge silver gilt candlesticks for the high altar at York Minster. His new chapel at Temple Newsom must have been a spectacular manifesto for the new liberal attitude to sacred imagery. It survived until the 1790s, when Francis Lady Irwin rebuilt it as a new kitchen, seen here in an old postcard. From that date until Emily Mennell Ingram's conversion of the library upstairs in 1877, there was no in-house chapel at Temple Newsom. Sir Arthur's new chapel was situated in the easternmost section of the North Wing, rising through two stories, with a family pew in the gallery approached from a stairway at the end of the picture gallery. Just how it was configured is still something of a mystery. The household would have been entered, the household would have entered from the adjacent chapel chamber on the ground floor, and the external staff and others from a door in the courtyard, still there, of course. It was lit, as you can see there, uh, by two round-headed windows uh, on the south side and another on the east. They were supplied with heraldic glass by Bernard Dietzenhofer which was removed to the newly remodeled Great Hall at the time the chapel disappeared in the 1790s. The chapel's appearance can be surmised by the building records. Whoops, I think we need to move on, yeah. The chapel's appearance can be surmised from the building records and a very few surviving artifacts. It appears to have been clad in full-length panel paintings of Old Testament prophets set into the paneling and I show you just two here out of, I think, at least a dozen, if not more, I forget exactly the number, which have all survived in terrible condition, um, set into the panelling with an altarpiece above the altar of the Last Supper and a large painting of the, la of the Supper at Emmaus, probably above the family pew. These were painted by an artist, one John Carlton, otherwise entirely unknown and unrecorded. The painting of the supper at Emmaus, costing 10 pounds, has survived. Very interestingly, it is a copy of a famous original by Titian, at that time in the collection of King Charles I, but now in the Louvre. One can only surmise that the artist was given permission to copy it while it was at Whitehall Palace. The painting of the Last Supper, on the other hand, was given to St Mary's here by Lady Irwin in 1795 but it seems to have entirely disappeared. It may well have been returned to the house in later years, uh, but it has subsequently been lost. Oh, sorry to go back. Actually, no. um, probably in the same year, 1795, the pulpit of the Jacobean Chapel was either given or somehow acquired by the Methodist Church in Halton. It is a remarkably fine example of Jacobean carving 
from the well-known workshop of Thomas Ventris, who equipped much of the rebuilt house with its panelling and carved ornament. He also worked for Sir Arthur Ingram at his other house at Sheriff Hutton, north of York, and for John Harrison at St John's Church in Brigate. The Methodists later converted the octagon pulpit into a single continuous panel, which is how it was when we bought it back from them in the 1980s and then restored it to its original octagonal shape. It was here in the domestic chapel that the spiritual life of the household was centred. Daily prayers, possibly matins on Sundays, but never the sacrament, baptisms and weddings, but never funerals. It would have been orchestrated by Lord Irwin's chaplain, who frequently doubled up as the boys' tutors, um, as well as being often the vicar of Wickkirk. In this way, the vicar could earn a much-needed addition to his own meagre stipend. Wickkirk was never a well-endowed benefice, and its vicar often held it in plurality with other churches, leaving the ministrations of the parish to a curate. A charming event, a little vignette, I can quote to you, must have taken place in the chapel at Temple Newsom in 1707, when Lady Irwin's confidential maid, the young Mildred Bachelor, so-called, who also seemed to, have, seemed to have been a kind of school matron to the, to the nine sons of the house, married the rather elderly 52-year-old newly retired estate steward, John Rhodes. After being widowed only four years later, Mildred went on to marry the vestry clerk at York Minster. And it was this same John Rhodes who, in his will of 1711, charged his copyhold estate at Temple Newsom with an annuity of three pounds a year for the clothing of three of the poorest people in the parish each Christmas, and the interest on £100 to the vicar of Wickkirk for delivering ten, quote, orthodox sermons a year between Midsummer and Michaelmas. In parenthesis, it should be noted here that John Rhodes's, John Rhodes's pastoral role, his employer, Arthur III Lord Irwin, had died in 1702, leaving his 35-year-old widow with nine, yes, nine sons to bring up, aged between 16 and three months. The years following must have, see, must have seen unbelievable chaos, is all one can imagine, in the house with these, three, with these highly spirited boys running completely amok. John Rhodes was one of their father's trustees, together with Lady Irwin, <clears throat> and it would have been down to him to be in loco parentis to these boys. They were finally sent off to boarding school, most of them, first to a prep school run by a vicar in Nottingley, and then to Westminster and finally to Cambridge. Mr Ray, then the vicar of Wickkirk, doubled up as both tutor to the boys and chaplain to the household over these years. But we are running ahead of ourselves. Um, Sir Arthur Ingram's eldest grandson was created first Viscount Irwin at the Restoration, but lived only an additional six years of unbridled extravagance before dying in 1666, leaving debts of nearly £12,000. His legacy to the church comes in the form of a silver, of a silver communion cup presented to the church in the year of his death. The inscription can be seen across the front of the cup, together with the shield of arms and the Viscount's coronet. The cup had actually begun life as a secular wine cup, and had been made in 1609, no doubt part of his grandfather Sir Arthur Ingram's, quote, store of massy plate. By 1666, it had become seriously old-fashioned, although perhaps a certain sentimentality was by now attached to it, preventing it from being handed back to the silversmiths for melting down or in exchange for credit. This practice of presenting the parish church with old-fashioned but venerable secular pieces was already widespread and was to continue well into the 20th century. What is particularly interesting is that the cup has a maker's mark for John Acton, who was the royal goldsmith to King James I and Charles I, well known for the fine quality of his work. It was he who negotiated the sale of a large quantity of English royal plate to the Tsar of Muscovy, where it can still be seen in the treasury in the Kremlin. This cup is a relatively modest example of his repertoire. A much more ambitious piece is the Mostyn Flagon, also on the screen there, bought by Temple Newsom in 1979. Replete with wonderful grotesque engraving, it is one of the masterpieces of early 17th century goldsmith's work. The other significant gift of plate to the church came in 1743 with the gift of two big flagons from Henry VII Viscount and his wife Anne. These were made by the silversmith partnership of Anne Craig 
and John Neville, a good and reliable firm of goldsmiths in the Haymarket in London. The invoice for the flagons survives and describes them, quote, as two neat silver flagons to hold four quarts of wine each, amounting to 197 ounces, nine penny weight, charged at six shillings and tuppence an ounce for the bullion silver, amounting to 61 pounds, and an additional two shillings an ounce for the making, i.e. their manufacture. With the cost of gilding the interiors at 10 guineas, a large case, and the cost of engraving the inscriptions, they came to a total of 109 pounds, eight shillings and eight pence. And this was partially offset by credit for six pounds, 19 and seven pence. Just go back a second, there we are. The flagons, as I say, are extremely heavy to handle, even without being filled with wine. Their size are evidence of the huge quantities of wine required for Holy Communion on the nine occasions of the year when the sacrament was celebrated. At this time, there were some 700 souls in the parish, of which some 200 were regular communicants, consuming approximately 10 gallons of wine a year and costing the parish some three pounds, five shillings a year. One must remember that there would be other flagons made of pewter also available for the celebration. But, whoops, sorry, just going forward. However, I often wonder, actually, if these, th these two massive silver flagons were actually really intended to be ornamental and to be on display on the altar, just as we see in that engraving of a communion service in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, this is a considerable sum for anyone, let alone Henry and Anne, whose income of 5,000 a year was saddled with huge debts and mortgages incurred by the family's losses in the South Sea bubble. The jointures of no less than three widowed Lady Irwins, each claiming a thousand a year, and the huge costs of rebuilding the North and West Wings, including the new picture gallery. It was just as well that, the, that his heir, the future ninth Viscount, fell in love and married one of the greatest heiresses in London, thus saving the family's bacon in the nick of time. Not surprisingly, there were frequent thefts of silver from parish churches at this time. At Whitkirk, the practice was for all the plate to be kept in safekeeping at Temple Newsom, only brought to the church on days when the sacrament was to be celebrated, some nine times a year, as we've seen. The sexton, with his wheelbarrow, would be paid threepence, and later sixpence, for each trip. The butler at the house would be paid two shillings and sixpence in the early 19th century for cleaning the silver in readiness for use. The first, Viscount died, uh, the first Viscount died in London in 1666. Whoops, I think I'll go forward there. Well, uh, and his remains had to be brought to Yorkshire for the funeral in a seemly manner. The total cost for his funeral was a staggering 555 pounds, eight shillings and five pence. This would have included no less than 180 pounds for black cloth for draping the church and the principal rooms of the house during the period of mourning. Then there would be the undertaker's cost for the coffin, the minimum of a week's transportation on the road with coachmen, postilions, attendant mourners, with all their expenses, gifts to the poor, hatchments, mourning rings, tolling the bells, etc. From this date on, nearly all the Viscounts and many of their spouses and descendants were buried in the family vault, with the exception of the fifth Viscount, who was buried in Westminster Abbey. The records of their funerals have all survived revealing the colossal expenses involved. We've mentioned already uh, the first Viscount, but for the third Viscount, £654 in 1702, £460 pounds for his eldest son, the fourth Viscount, just 12 years later, £310 pounds for the fifth Viscount, £440 pounds for the bachelor, sixth Viscount, who died in Bath, requiring 18 black-plumed co coach horses, coachmen and postilions, accompanying the two freshly repainted black carriages. When you compare this with the average poor person's funeral costs at this time, a Mr. Reed, who died on the 5th of December, 1766, and whose costs were a mere six shillings and ten pence. It seems curious, yep, yeah, these are rather wonderful images. Um, it seems curious, however, that there are only two sculptural monuments dedicated to the nine Viscounts, who reigned over the great house from the Restoration until they became extinct in the male line with the death of the ninth and last Lord Erwin in 1778. The first exception is the second Viscount, who died in 1688. This is the spectacular piece made by Jan van Nost, 
at a cost of some £700. Sorry about all this, all this money, but um, <laughs> that's what we know about. Which still stands, albeit bereft of its tomb chest. He is seen half reclining, half rising, with his grieving widow beside him and his 15-month-old daughter, who was to die just seven weeks after her father at his feet. The figures were added some seven years after the tomb was finished. He was just 25, she was 21. His widow was to live another 58 years um, until, uh, until, she, until 1746, when she died aged 79. The monument originally covered the southwest window of the Ingram Chapel, but was moved to its present location in the reordering of 1901. The coffins would always have been would always have incorporated a brass or silvered shield with the name of the arms of the remains it contained. These are often beautifully engraved with exquisite calligraphy. When the Ingram family vault was sealed in 1901, as there was no more family to be interred there, they were removed from the coffins and hung on the walls of the South Chapel. Today they are at safekeeping at Temple Newsom. The second sculptural monument. Um, is to the ninth and last Lord Erwin and his wife, the great heiress, Frances, the natural daughter of Samuel Shepherd, a director of the East India Company. It was erected by their eldest daughter, Lady Hartford, at her mother's death in 1807. It is signed by Joseph Nollikins and, show, and shows an elegant female figure grieving over an urn. Beneath is a lengthy inscription extolling Lady Erwin's virtues, composed, interestingly, by her son-in-law, Lord William Gordon. It is a rather charming elegy which, for all its doggerel, seems genuinely felt. For indeed, we know a great deal about this lady whose benign presence made itself widely, not only in her own household, but in the wider community here in Yorkshire as well as in Sussex, where the family had important political influence through their ownership of the rotten borough of Horsham, returning two MPs to Parliament. I will read just a few lines. In the cold grave where earthborn sorrows cease, Thine honoured aged mother sleeps in peace. Long in the paths of virtue had she trod, each step directed by the hand of God. Each duty piously fulfilled in life of mother, daughter, neighbour, friend and wife. Then a few lines later, it does go on and on and on. Uh, Full oft an angel errand would she go to carry comfort to the house of woe, oft to the family of silent grief, bear unsolicited, unhoped for relief. And later... And full at earthly morn and evening late, the child of want found welcome at her gate, while charity within her ancient hall dealt largesse, food and raiment, united all. Indeed, Lady Irwin's generous nature and kind heart is attested by many. Her spontaneous acts of charity towards the poor, her foundation of a school of needlework for young, illiterate village girls, her loyalty to her servants and her tenants, None of this, of course, stopped her from enjoying the card tables and parties of Bath and Mayfair, nor indeed the political shenanigans she enjoyed by being possessed of her two rotten parliamentary seats, which all had to be given up, of course, at the time of the Great Reform Act. But all that is another story. Lady Irwin was very much a woman of the age of reason, although greatly tempered by a feminine sensibility, almost sentimentality. Somewhat late in life, she decided to make extensive changes and modernizations at Temple Newsom, as she wrote to a friend, quote, I amuse myself wonderfully, and I may say prodigiously, for I have attacked a huge wing of Temple Newsom and have pulled down walls as thick as the Tower of London for the sole purpose of building them up again, and here I am in the midst of my own nonsensical self. She was referring to the South Wing, which she rebuilt, creating new reception rooms and bedrooms for herself and her five daughters. It involved moving the kitchens to the north wing, which in its turn involved the demolition of the Jacobean chapel, as we have seen. This now became the vast new kitchen, with its massive range against the north wall. The fittings, as I have mentioned, were removed, as we have seen, with the altarpiece given to St Mary's and the pulpit to the Methodists in Halton. Oops. Thus, for the next 80 years, there was no chapel at Temple Newsom and no resident chaplain. One can only surmise that this must have led to a bigger role for the parish church, for the household, in the practice of their religion. But we cannot know. Lord William Gordon, Lloyd William's son-in-law, who composed the elegy and brother-in-law to Lady Hartford, was married to the second daughter of the house, Frances, who was thereafter always known as Lady William Gordon. Lord, Lord William was, of course, the brother of the famous madcap Lord George Gordon, the leader of the anti-Catholic riots in London in 1780. 
Um, uh, Lord William was a well-known philanderer, albeit he got away with it by being extremely charming. Despite everything, his wife and her family remained absolutely devoted to him, and his monument is also in the church, improbably wearing a kilt over that. Lord William's cavortings included getting a local girl pregnant, but to her eternal credit, his wife semi-adopted the illegitimate child, had him educated at considerable expense, and launched him into a, the East India Company, where he made a fortune, retired as a country gent to Lincolnshire, where his descendants live to this day. Lady William seems to have been more, more often resident at Temple Newsome after her mother's death in 1807 than her sister, Lady Hartford, and Lady William inherited the property in her own right in 1834. Like many ladies of the Regency who had an interesting youth, she became deeply pious and philanthropic in her older years. Her acts of charity were remembered well into the rest of the century. In 1835, she set up a trust of 900 pounds for the poor of the parish to be distributed in sums of not less than 10 shillings or more than five pounds. This was augmented by a further 1,000 pounds in 1839. Just before her death, she gave 200 pounds and all the necessary stone building materials from her quarry at Colton for the building of the new council school at Halton in 1840. After Lady William's death and during the middle years of the 19th century, the family were only occasionally in residence at Temple Newsome and then largely during the autumn shooting season. Their main residence was now at Hall Cross in Staffordshire, the seat of the Mennells, the house of Lady William's sister, Elizabeth, who had married into this famous fox hunting family. But we hear something of their involvement with the parish here, uh, contributing, for example, to the restoration of the church in, 1855, in the 1855 campaign especially by Admiral Mannell. But things changed very drastically at Temple Newsom after Hugo Francis Mannell Ingram, the very last male descendant of Sir Arthur Ingram, died without an heir in 1871. His widow was the gifted and intensely romantic Emily, née Wood, the daughter of Charles Wood, first Viscount Halifax, and a former Chancellor of the Exchequer. She now inherited all his estates, becoming one of the richest independent women in the country. In her deep grief, which almost echoed that of her friend, Queen Victoria, she turned to the consolations of religion. Here she was greatly influenced by her brother, the future second Viscount Halifax, who was to become one of the leaders of the Anglo-Catholic wing of the Church of England. It was almost certainly he who suggested Emily build a church at Hall Cross as a memorial to her husband not just a monument in the nearby parish at Yoxall, nor a mausoleum in the park, but a completely new parish church. It was an extremely ambitious thing to do, um, especially for a woman at this time, but the project was one which Emily threw herself into, heart and soul, and its building and beautification became a lifelong obsession for her. The Church of the Holy Angels lies just outside the gardens, uh, at Hall Cross, with a private gate giving directly onto the churchyard. Its tower is very visible from the gardens and the house. It is considered uh, one of the, it is considered the early masterpiece of one of the greatest Gothic revival architects, George Frederick Bodley and his partner, Thomas Garner. The story of Bodley's collaboration with Emily has become legendary. Between them, they created what many consider the most moving and beautiful of all Victorian churches, giving, quote, an indescribable impression of medieval glamour and the manifesto church of Anglo-Catholicism. There was to be no truck with such non-Catholic ideas as family pews. Everyone was equal when they came to the church. In this context, every summer, she lent a house on the estate to the Lex Mundi group of forward-looking clergy from Oxford who were formulating a new attitude to social justice. It was the Anglican equivalent to the group around Pope Leo XIII who was, form who was, for who was formulating the new Catholic social teaching, which resulted in the great encyclical Rerum Novarum in 1893. I could give a whole lecture on the story of this church, but I will desist. For our purposes, there are some significant things to note. One of the biggest problems she and Bodley had to manage was where to place Hugo's monument. Emily wanted it placing right in the centre of the chancel in front of the high altar, but this was ruled out as almost blasphemous by Bodley. In the end, it was placed beneath the OG arch on the south side of the chancel, see over there, 
forming a screen to the so-called Chantry Chapel to the south. In the fullness of time, Emily's own monument was to become the pendant to Hugo's on the other side of the same chapel. And here, actually, we come to something. The prototype for this kind of arrangement has always been considered the famous Percy tomb at Beverly Minster, but it has literally only just occurred to me that the precedent for this arrangement was, of course, the Scargill Monument here at Wickkirk, which forms a screen to the Ingram Chapel, and which, of course, Bodley would have known about. So here, nearest to me, you've got, you see one there dimly, is actually where Hugo's tomb is. Two is where Emily's was to be placed eventually. And you see how that corresponds, sort of dimly, to exactly the same arrangement um, here at Wickkirk. <clears throat> Work began in 1872 and was sufficiently complete for the first service of communion to take place on the 25th of January, 1876. A new, very small parish of just 200 souls had to be carved out of the uh, neighbouring ones at Yoxall and Newborough, and it was ratified by Queen Victoria on the 6th of August, 1874, by an order in council signed at Balmoral. The establishment of the church continued, sorry, the embellishment of the church continued right up to Emily's death and beyond. Stained glass was produced by Berlinson and Grills, carved decoration and statues by Farmer and Brindley, and later Bridgmans of Lichfield, the Stations of the Cross by de Wint and de Burke of Antwerp, the screen by Zwink of, of, of Oberammergau, the font, etc., etc. The whole ensemble was intended very deliberately to evoke Emily's vision of the beauty of holiness. A full choral liturgy was able to be celebrated with a choir drawn from the boys of the orphanage, which she established in the nearby hamlet, the home of the Good Shepherd, under the guardianship of the Sisters of the Society of St. Margaret. Her preferred music was from Mozart, Guno, Rossini, and Meyerbeer. She was, of course, able to install her own clergy, foremost of which was the celebrated preacher, Canon William Knox Little, who also acted as her spiritual director, confessor, and chaplain frequently accompanying her on her yacht, the Ariadne, on its annual three-month cruises on the Mediterranean. Any external, oops, any external opposition to the regime at Horcross by the Kensitites and the other militant evangelicals was seen off by her army of gardeners and estate staff who had instructions to duck the offenders in the nearby lake. Perhaps not surprisingly, Emily did not terribly enjoy the form of worship then being practiced at Whitkirk. Thus she set about creating a new chapel in the former Georgian library in the north wing at Temple Newsom, immediately adjacent to the picture gallery and above the kitchens which had once been the place of the Jacobean chapel. Once again she employed Bodley for all the necessary work. Apart from the installation of a black and white Belgian marble altar and reredos in a Baroque style, Bodley merely camouflaged the existing Georgian architecture with a wealth of decorative ornament. The columns were entwined with lead laurel leaves picked out in gold, the bookcases covered with Watson Co.'s classic down plush velvet, an organ by Farmer and Brindley of Leeds and stained glass by Berlinson and Grills were installed. The predominant colour was Bodley's favourite dark turquoise, lit by a hanging spider brass chandelier with hanging sanctuary lamps in front of the altar. The effect was one of dusky luminosity. It was here that the household would assemble for prayers each morning and for celebrations on Sundays, with Lady Mary, Emily's sister-in-law, often playing the organ. The seating was collegiate style, with the family at the back, with Emily in the centre, of course, the male servants on one side, the females on the other, as shown on this sketch by Emily's nephew Francis in his memoirs. A choir of boys would be provided on Sundays from the estate and the village, and provided with appropriate rust-coloured cassocks. The curates at St Mary's became her official chaplains. John Groves in 1877, Frank Bromage in 1895, and Joshua Prentice in 1900. Emily found much consolation in her new chapel, and it encouraged her to spend more time at Temple Newsom, which hitherto she had not greatly enjoyed visiting. As she got older, her usual routine was to rise late from her bedroom, seen at the far end of the picture gallery there, um, spend the morning and luncheon in the picture gallery next door, have a drive in the park in the afternoon, return to the gallery for tea, and then move into the chapel for evening prayers. This sense of detachment from the parish of Whitkirk did not, however, preclude her involvement with other charitable work in Leeds. 
In 1887, for Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee, she threw open the park for an entertainment and tea for 6,000 Sunday school children of all Christian denominations in Leeds. It was an extraordinary sight by all accounts, with over 100 wagons decorated with banners conveying the children in one huge procession led by the band of the Leeds Artillery Volunteers. At the end, Emily made a speech and led, and led the crowd with three cheers for the Queen and the national anthem. On another occasion, in June 1896, she hosted a three-day fete for the benefit of Horbury House, an Anglican community dedicated to the rescue of fallen women, with games and entertainments, bands, bands playing, and sales of work. The first day alone brought in over 1,500 pounds, the equivalent to at least 20,000 pounds in today's money. Emily was fully aware of her responsibilities as a local landowner. Building a new church for her tenants at the mining village of Altofts in 1874, costing £10,000. Greatly extending and beautifying the church at Lawton in Lincolnshire. And for St Hilda's, a church she was very fond of in Leeds, Emily again allowed the park to host a bazaar which raised over £1,000. She herself provided £500 towards the porch and £300 to enlarge the adjoining school. But it was not until 1898 and the death of George Platt, the incumbent at Whitkirk, since 1863, that Emily was at last able to buy the advowson of St Mary's at Whitkirk from Trinity College, Cambridge, and to begin to put her mark on St Mary's and the life of the parish. As her first vicar, she nominated Gerald Sharp, who had served as a curate in Somerset and in London. He remained until 1910, when he was appointed the second bishop of New Guinea. In 1822, he became Archbishop of Brisbane, where he died in 1933, age 68. During his period Whitkirk, at Whitkirk, many alterations were made. First, Bodley, was extended, was, was, Bodley extended the chancel, for which Emily contributed a thousand pounds, while the vestry was rebuilt by the gift of the Morkels of Allsthorpe. The Ingram Chapel was reordered, as we have seen, and a new east window installed by Emily in memory of her husband in lieu of a monument. The glass in this window, you can dimly see, has angels at the top in the top lights with Christ in majesty in the centre. Below, left to right, are scenes of the agony in the garden, the descent from the cross in the middle, and the entombment. Of great interest is the descent of, from the cross, which is a copy of a painting then in the collection in the picture gallery at Temple Newson, at that time attributed to Dürer, but now, given, but now uh, subsequently given to the master of the St. Bartholomew altarpiece, painted in Cologne in about 1500. The original painting was sold by Lord Halifax to the National Gallery in London in 1981. The two south windows are, were given their heraldic glass by Emily at the same time. The first window, seen nearest to me on the left, um, has the shields of the historic owners of the estate. Reading from the left, very dimly here, at the top, the Templars, below them, the Knights Templars of St. John, the second light, the royal arms of King Henry VIII after Darcy's attainder, below those of the Countess of Pembroke, who held the estate here from 1322 to 1377. In the third light, on the top, Lennox for Matthew and Margaret Lennox, and below Darcy for Lord Thomas Lord Darcy. In the next window, we continue the theme into the modern age. The first light at the top has the Ingram arms, both versions, there are two versions of the Ingram arms. Below, Menel and points for Hugo Menel, who married Elizabeth Ingram. In the second light at the top, Menel, Ingram and Wood in a lozenge for Emily herself. Uh, below, the arms of Menel, Ingram and Pichu for Hugo Charles Menel Ingram, her father-in-law. In the third light at the far end there, Wood for the first Viscount Halifax, her, her father, and below, Menel Ingram and Wood for her husband, Hugo Francis Menel Ingram. So, in, but in addition to all this immortal glorification of her predecessors, Emily did not neglect her own more modest neighbours. In 1896, she built the Colton Institute at a cost of £1,300, intended as a Sunday school for the village children and for use as a billiards club for men during the week. Subscriptions were one shilling a, a year, and Emily's brother, Freddie, and the vicar of Whitkirk were joint trustees. In order to perpetuate her work in advancing her vision of the church, Emily established the Menel Church Trust in 1889. Its purpose was to, was to support the orphanage and the Church of the Holy Angels, 
and to exercise ecclesiastical patronage over the benefices which she had acquired. These consisted of no less than 14 parishes, but by 2012, the trustees had surrendered their rights over them to the relevant bishops. It seems a shame to end the story of Emily's regime with the disastrous tale of St. Edward's Holberg. It was her last project and a valiant attempt to create a new parish in a new working class neighborhood with a magnificent church at its very center. It followed the sale of land from the estate for redevelopment, having held back enough to build a new parish church, a clergy house, a school, and a church hall, all of which she paid for to be built at a cost of 30,000 pounds. Bodley was called in yet again to design a magnificent but austere brick church with all the usual craftsmen involved for its embellishment, with Bridgman supplying an enormous reredos. Alas, the hoped-for housing never materialized and the area became zoned for light industry. As others have suggested, it was an example of too much enthusiasm on the part of well-wishers. The people it was meant to support felt a very little con connection with it as they had never been involved in its creation. Despite a series of heroic priests, the church was finally demolished in 1985, having suffered years of shocking vandalism. Mercifully, the great Raridos was saved and given to Christ Church, Moss Side, Manchester, and other fittings went to St. Bartholomew's Armley. Emily's death at Temple Newsom in December 1904 saw a crowd of over 200 tenants attend her funeral at Hall Cross, taken there on a specially chartered train. Despite her reputation for being standoffish, even somewhat cold person among those who did not know her, she made generous bequests to all her staff and dependents. But her enduring legacy is, is surely her church at Holy Angels. After many years of struggle, it has found a new purpose in becoming a very popular venue for weddings, especially appropriate for a place built to celebrate marital happiness. After the ceremonies, the newly married couples and their guests walk through Emily's garden gate into the hall, which is now, of course, a high-class hotel and spa. A very different kind of legacy lives on, lives on at Temple Newsom and St. Mary's with the annual service which takes place in the gallery every September, usually attended by Lord Halifax. It was one of the three covenants which were imposed over the property when it was sold to Leeds in 1922, that a Eucharistic service according to the rites of the Church of England should be celebrated every year. It has become a major fixture in the calendar of the house at a time when all the community can finally come together in thanksgiving. So there you are, a quick run through of uh, a thousand years of uh, relationships, as you might say. So thank you for listening to me. <clears throat>
The exhibition will be open. There are more items that will be on show tomorrow and Sunday, 10 till 4 tomorrow, and 2 till 4 on Sunday afternoon. And as uh, both James and Matthew have mentioned, we do have the annual service at Temple Museum House next Sunday. Details are on Whitcote Church website. Thank you very much. Thank you.